Welcome back to Real Vision Crypto's After the Hype, Reality Sets In for NFTs. We've looked at NFT technology and how individuals are beginning to use it. Now, we'll look more closely at the communities surrounding NFTs. Here, Duncan and Griffin Cock Foster, founders of the NFT marketplace Nifty Gateway, talk with Rao Pal about founding Nifty Gateway and the ways in which they see communities at the heart of NFTs. Duncan Griffin, great to get you on uh, Real Vision. Hey, Rao, thanks, thanks for having us. us. I'd love to hear your guys' stories. How the hell did you get into all of this? And how did you manage to get in so early? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> I think a lot of the time when people get into something early in the startup world, it's not because, uh, you know, I think early is the wrong word. I think Duncan and I just looked at NFTs and we thought there was something there and we're like, we're going to start a company here and they'll blow up eventually. Um, you know, it, it was more based on us thinking that the tech had real promise. It, it was really when CryptoKitties blew up in 2017. Duncan and I had both graduated college. We were both working at jobs at big companies. Uh, we kind of realized that that wasn't for us. So we both quit and we were looking to start a company and we noticed the explosive growth of CryptoKitties and sort of subsequent decline. But I think most people took away from that, that CryptoKitties have been a fad, but we took away from that, that, hey, there's something here. Where, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. The, the significant thing is that they got so popular in the first place. Um, so we just, yeah, we're really big believers in NFT technology and wanted to take a bet on it. And we're like, we're going to start a company and we're going to try and start one of the most important companies for NFTs. That was our goal. So Duncan, when you first saw CryptoKitties and NFTs, what was the light bulb for you outside of that particular use case? Because, you know, that was the early use case, but People had only started. Yeah, people were talking about tokenizing assets, but it it hadn't got anywhere yet. What what made you think suddenly? Actually, this could be bigger than that. Totally. Um, you know, at the time, I was really i I had spent a lot of time trying to think about like what what technology trends would succeed and what ones would fail. And overall, I kind of my perspective was like, wow, it's actually really difficult to determine if you just sort of think about it logically and. When I first heard about NFTs and CryptoKitties, you know, I thought the idea was was pretty crazy, um, and almost logically, I couldn't believe that people were doing it because it just seemed so counterintuitive. But then, really, what happened is um, I started looking at the the discords where NFT collectors were hanging out, and I started looking at all the the new projects that people were starting. Um, and really, I saw the the passion of the NFT collector community, and I saw how engaged people were not just with crypto kitties but with all the nft projects beyond that um you know we we provided credit card purchasing support for the nft axie land sale which was a, a long long time ago but people were abs absolutely rabid for the nft axie land sale and they were doing whatever they could some of them were staying up till 3 a.m 4 a.m to get those nfts and really my perspective was you know even if even if i don't understand this yet the fact that people are so completely passionate about this and are you know literally staying up till 3 a.m just to get these nfts that probably means that there is something there so i should suspend my disbelief and instead instead approach the space with okay why are people so passionate as opposed to i can't believe people are are so passionate so i think it's really a perspective of trying to understand why something that is popular is popular as opposed to instead just operating from your biases and and saying, I can't believe how how stupid this popular thing is. I can't believe other people like it. And I think that was really the perspective that led us to to get involved in the NFT space before it was before it had blown up. Um, and uh, I, I think it's a good heuristic to use if you're trying to evaluate what technologies are fads and what are are actually going to have breakout success. You know, instead of thinking like, does this personally make sense to me? Look at how people are using it and look at how passionate the people. Who are using it are if they're crazy passionate then it's probably a good sign that there's something there and also it's clear that gaming was well ahead of all of this so a lot of the early applications were based around gaming and the gaming world had kind of understood this digital ownership of assets they didn't have nfts but but you had certain ways and it was just a a move from that i think right yeah 100 percent um everybody thought you know that that was kind of the conversation in in 2017 2018 everybody thought that uh, 
gaming was going to be the breakout use case of of NFTs. And uh, I think we were actually a bit contrarian in, in thinking that it would be more focused on digital art and collectibles. And again, the reason for that was everybody was talking about gaming use cases and using NFTs to track provenance of physical items. Every, that's the use cases that everybody was talking about. But the use cases that people were, were actually doing were all collectibles and, and art related. That's the Those were the NFTs that people were actually spending money on. So yeah, it was... It was pretty interesting. And I think gaming really laid the foundation in people's minds for, you know, oh, I can own something that's truly digital. And then NFTs took it a step further where, okay, I can actually own this item in a way that I can't own a, a gaming item. Because I make this analogy all the time. Um, if you own a skin in Fortnite and the game shuts down, your Fortnite skin disappears. I mean, imagine if owning a pair of Nike shoes, imagine if you owned a pair of Nike shoes and Nike shut down and your Nike shoes just disappeared. That, that doesn't make any sense. No, and also, imagine if your Nike shoes, you left the United States and went to the United Kingdom and suddenly your Nike shoes <laughs> disappear. Right. Right. So in metaverses or games, you, you couldn't move from one place to another with the same set of goods that you att um, attach digital value to. So it was kind of, it needed a solution for sure. Exactly, yeah. And I think from, from that perspective, NFTs were just sort of... Uh, you know, they, they fit perfectly, but it was pretty difficult to see that in, in 2017, 2018. So Griffin, talk us through starting Nifty Gateway and, <laughs> and why you did it and how you did it. You know, what, what, what was your premise? What did you want to achieve? And obviously things change as you go, but what, what did you want to do at that point? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> our premise has not changed very much since we started Nifty Gateway. Our mission originally was always to make NFTs accessible. Our, our company's mission statement is to get 1 billion people collecting NFTs. The way we've gone about that has changed a little bit, and we've kind of pivoted in terms of tactics, but our mission has always been that. And it's always been making it super easy for the average person to understand, access, buy, sell, store, create NFTs. That's always what we've been about. Um, and kind of the way that originated. The, the very first product idea we had was letting people buy NFTs with just a credit card because we noticed there was this very big gap. One story we always like to tell is that one of our investors tried to buy a CryptoKitty when it was super popular. And I, he just tried for four hours and then gave up. Like he was reading through the guides on MetaMask and transferring Ethereum. And I, I think people who are used to doing it don't understand just how difficult it is for non-technical people to really wrap their heads around. So our very first product was just letting you buy NFTs with a credit card. And that product was successful. That, that was something that Duncan and I just together were able to hack together. Um, and I think tactically, when you're starting a startup, it's all about the small wins adding up. You know, I, I think from the outside, you see these companies raising $100 million rounds, or you, know, you see Facebook now at a trillion dollar valuation. And it's kind of, it kind of is easy to forget the sort of iterative steps they took to get there. But Facebook launched as just a product to college kids and then it expanded college by college. And then only after that, it expanded to high schoolers. And they really had a lot of like small wins that added up along the way. So for Nifty Gateway, th that first small win was releasing the credit card product where people could buy NFTs with the credit card and people actually used it. And that validated for us like, hey, there's real demand here. Um, after that, we obviously met the Winklevoss twins who were interested in NFTs. We saw a chance for a great partnership. So they acquired our company and now we've kind of been building it under the Gemini umbrella, which has been fantastic. What it's turned into now is accessibility on all sides. Accessibility for artists to create great NFTs and us partnering with them and helping them market their NFTs and accessibility for customers buying, selling, storing and trading NFTs. Um, and we have a lot more products rolling out in this front. But that's always what Nifty Gateway has been about. We try to be the high quality marketplace, the high integrity marketplace, and the accessible marketplace. And it's so easy to just show up to Nifty Gateway, log in with an email and password and start buying NFTs. And that's, that's very, very powerful. And I think that will continue to be very powerful over the next few years. Because the internet only exploded because it became accessible. Accessibility is so important to large numbers of people. And yeah, I mean, we're just trying to get a billion people collecting NFTs and still working hard at that every day.
were you so how surprised were you by what happened in the last nine months? I mean, because it went from fringe to total explosion. I mean, did that take you by yeah. surprise how fast that grew? It definitely took us by surprise. I, so for Nifty, we launched we launched our marketplace about we launched it in March 2020, actually right when all the lockdowns were beginning, which was kind of funny because we've been preparing for it for months, and then the world starts locking down, and there's this huge recession. We're all just freaking out. We're like, God damn it, who's going to spend? thousands of dollars on digital collectibles now. Um, but we decided to go ahead with the launch anyway. And I, I think it worked you know, quite well. I think kind of lockdowns ended up being a bit of a tailwind. But we were just growing iteratively for those first 12 months. I mean, we grew consistently every month. Um, and it just kind of... It was a very high month over month growth rate. But it kind of like just kept compounding for us. <clears throat> and then in February and March, it really exploded much more than we thought. And I think we were very surprised by the level of growth we had, which... What's awesome to see, I, I don't really know why it exploded so quickly, but I do think it's very similar to cycles you've seen with other crypto projects. Bitcoin, I think, was very similar. I mean, I don't know why in 2013 and 2017, Bitcoin just went parabolic the way it did. You know, it's, it's so many factors coming together. And it, it's not like it's one announcement that changes everyone's mind, changes everyone's mind. And they're like, hey, I'm going to go buy NFTs. Really what it is is, Knowledge of NFTs just compounds among friend groups. So one person gets into it, then they tell their friend, and their friend gets into it, and then they tell a friend, and their friend gets into it. And it's kind of the slow compounding behind the scenes. And I, I think it just kind of exploded, and now it's dropped off a little bit. And I, I think it's very similar to these other cycles we've seen in crypto. But I, I don't know why it happened so early, but I think we all thought it was just a matter of time. I mean, NFTs are such powerful tech for enabling communities, and they have all these advantages. And, us, we just saw it as inevitable. So it definitely happened sooner than we thought, but you know, you know, we always thought it would happen eventually. Hey, if you like this clip, be sure to like and subscribe for more crypto related content. Also be sure to check out the full interview and more only on realvision.com slash crypto.